Hello from London and welcome to the September episode of the IFRS Foundation's monthly podcast. My name is Kasia Dzielewska and I'm part of the Foundation's communications team. Today, I'm joined by the chair of the International Accounting Standards Board, Hans Hugerwurst, and Sue Lloyd, the board's vice chair, is with us too. In this podcast, we'll update you on what's happened this month in the world of accounting standards. Our primary focus will be on this month's board meeting, which took place over three days from the 24th of September. Uh, We'll also touch on last month's other key developments. September certainly was a busy month. In particular, we held numerous meetings with our stakeholders. Hans, um, would you give us an insight into the meetings, please? Yeah, um, September uh, indeed was very busy. We always have our annual World Standard Setters Conference in here in London every September. It's a meeting with close to 100 standard setters from all around the world very useful event. We have hosted it annually since 2002. The conference really serves as a platform to exchange ideas and views. Uh, We get first-hand feedback from our stakeholders around the world, and they in turn get uh, in-depth information about the board's work, including forthcoming consultations, and we have uh, a lot of consultations uh, coming up. Uh, And national standard setters in these consultations play a very important role. Uh, Recently, we did an analysis as to how many comment letters they have sent us in the past couple of years. In the past five years, they came to more than uh, 1,100 uh, letters, about a quarter of the total uh, number of letters that we uh, get. So they are very important to us. And uh, in my speech at the event, um, I uh, talked about the uh, utmost importance of our collaborating closely with them. And looking back, I think, you know, we can really be uh, proud of what we are achieving with uh, the national uh, standard setters um, in a world where uh, global standards are under uh, severe pressure. Um, IFRS is still solid and gaining ground even. And that is in, 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 in a, to a great extent due to the excellent relationship of trust that we have with the local uh, standard setters. So it was, again, a very good event, very informative both for the standard setters, but also for us, it was very interactive. So we got some first-hand reactions to uh, all the uh, projects that we have outstanding. Excellent. So let's now turn to the meeting of the IFRS Advisory Council. For those of you who don't know or perhaps uh, who need reminding, the IFRS Advisory Council is the body that provides formal advice to the board and to the trustees. The council brings together a wide range of representatives from organizations with an interest in international financial reporting. So how did this month's council meeting go, Hans? Yeah, we had a a meeting for two days in uh, mid-September and uh, we worked our way through a very full agenda. What was particularly interesting this time uh, was a uh, panel discussion that we had with people uh, that are involved with provision of financial data and and that use a lot of technology to to do so. So the topic of uh, the panel discussion was what are the effects of technology on the investment process? Mm -hmm. And it is very clear that apart from the still very important information that people receive through the financial statements, that they get a lot of additional data, for example, from uh, data aggregators. And what was also clear and which is important to our work is that these people all said for an efficient transmission of financial information through the use of technology, it's very important that our data are structured well. Mm -hmm. So that means that our work on the taxonomy, which makes our uh, information uh, machine readable, is extremely um, uh, important. And also our work on the primary financial statements that will provide more structure to the financial statements is also very important for efficient provision of information through technology. And also it was mentioned that the management commentary, where more narrative information is given about a a company, that it's also important that that is well structured. So that is something to keep in mind in our work on the management commentary practice statement. Great. Thank you, Hans. So now let's move on to this month's board meeting and let's start with Sue's favorite topic, financial instruments. Shall we talk about financial instruments with characteristics of equity, FIS for short, 
uh, first, please. Sure. So this is a project dealing with the accounting for financial instruments that companies issue, dealing with whether they should be classified as, as debt or equity, and also the information that's provided about those instruments to people reading their financial statements. And our objective is really to, to look at whether there's ways to improve the information that is provided to investors. So we put out a discussion paper last year, mm -hmm. and um, at the last two board meetings we've been going through a detailed analysis of the feedback from the discussion paper and working out what to do. Great. And uh, what was discussed FICE-wise this month then? <laughs> <laughs> so this month was a, an interesting month. So what the staff did was they pulled together the sort of strands of feedback we got from all of the different questions in the document and really asked the board what approach do we want the staff to take when they're thinking about how we might move forward to re-deliberate this project and they asked us to choose I think between five different alternatives um, at one end of the spectrum a really broad project that might go back to reconsidering what's debt and equity all the way back in the conceptual framework oh <laughs> right through to just focusing on presentation and disclosure and a few variants in between and as Hans rightly said, if uh, the staff have steered us towards the middle by making it look like the reasonable middle ground, <laughs> and uh, that's indeed what we did vote for. So what we agreed with this was, was the staff's recommendation, which is really to take a focused approach to look at, in, in particular at some of the areas of the existing standard IES 32 today that give rise to challenges in interpretation and consistency of application and practice, and really try to direct our work to addressing those practice issues, using some of the ideas from the discussion paper to really bolster the principles that underlie IES 32. So a pretty focused approach is what the staff will investigate. Great. So another financial instruments related project is the interest rate benchmark reform, uh, commonly known by its acronym IBOR. Uh, what would the next steps entail, Sue? So the good news is that at the end of September we uh, met our objective, which was to publish the narrow scope amendments we made to our, our existing financial instrument standards, IES 39, IFRS 9 and IFRS 7, to help people in this period of uncertainty to deal with some of the forward-looking assessments for hedge accounting under IFRS standards. And, and we completed that at the end of September, so hopefully people will be able to use that for their year-end financial statements. So that was the end of what we called Phase 1. But even before we'd published that document, in the same week, the board started talking about phase two. And this is where we're going to look at what the accounting uh, consequences are and should be when people actually change their contracts to replace their existing benchmark interest rates with the new interest rates. And what we did uh, at the September meeting was talked about the scope of the issues that we look at at phase two and also the sort of rough timeline for those discussions and I think the main message for people listening is that we know that we need to move as quickly as possible for phase two, similarly to phase one, and we'll start discussing the specifics in phase two at the October meeting. So uh, we have spoken about FICE and IBOR. I guess it's time to move on to BCUCC. For those of you who think that I'm talking in double dutch, let me explain that BCUCC is our business combinations under common control project. Uh, last month, the board discussed alternative measurement approach that could be applied to transactions involving business combinations under common control. So, would you like to give us an update on that too? Sure. So, as people may know, most business combinations are accounted for applying IFRS 3, but there's a scope exclusion from IFRS 3, so you don't have to apply it to business combinations under common control. And what is that? That's a transaction, for example, if you've got a common parent company with two sister companies, if one of the sister companies were to buy the other, that would be a business combination under common control. Mm -hmm. So the aim of this project is to determine what the accounting should be required to be uh, for those types of transactions. Should it be something like acquisition type accounting under IFRS 3 or something different? And this month we took an important decision on the measurement approaches for the upcoming discussion paper and we decided that we wouldn't require or we wouldn't propose requiring a single measurement approach for all business combinations under common control. And we also decided on what will be in the discussion paper in terms of proposing when a current value approach would be required 
and when a so-called predecessor approach would be required for these types of transactions. Sorry, uh, perhaps could you briefly explain these two different approaches? It's a good challenge. And <laughs> okay, so really, simplistically speaking, the predecessor approach means that when the sister company buys its sister, it uses existing carrying amounts to account for the assets and liabilities it buys rather than looking at what their current fair value is in the market. Whereas a current value approach would be along the lines of IFRS 3, so you'd be doing acquisition accounting and comparing the amount that you paid for the acquisition with the current or fair values of the assets and liabilities that you've acquired. Perfect. I think I understood. <laughs> so our next topic is one that uh, probably won't keep you awake at night. Indeed, perhaps it might be a cure for insomnia, but it's nevertheless very important when it comes to the board's work program over the next five years. And what I'm talking about is our forthcoming agenda consultation. Just to refresh for our listeners' memories, the ISB is required as part of its due process to undertake a public consultation on its work program every five years. So Hans, would you like to walk us through it? Yeah, so uh, the next agenda consultation will only take place in 2020, so we still have some time to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have started preparations. The uh, objective of the agenda consultation is to seek public input on the strategic direction of the ISB's work program and also to see whether it's well balanced. The staff suggested that we first do some outreach to see what, is, what kind of projects people might be interested mm -hmm. in. And then they proposed, and we agreed with that, that we should basically provide our stakeholders with a detailed list of projects without that being the definitive list and also to give them some idea of what kind of staff capacity would be involved in fulfilling such a uh, project so that people can better weigh which projects they would be particularly interested uh, in. So without really creating a definitive straw man, uh, this is what we think the whole the, the program uh, should look like as, as, as a whole. First, we are now going to uh, do some outreach to see uh, are there in our list of projects that we could think of are there complete non-starters or mm -hmm. not. And, uh, and then we will make a, a sort of a long list of uh, detailed project descriptions where people can give preferences uh, for in the uh, agenda consultation. Mm -hmm. Great. So we would like all of our stakeholders to get involved in those conversations. And another consultation that is coming up is linked to the review of the IFRS for SME standard. So what's the latest on that, Hans? Well, I think the most important decision uh, that the board took this month was about the scope of the project, mm -hmm. of, of the, sp the scope of IFRS for SMEs. That's a recurring theme. As you know, we have written as the, the simplified IFRS for SMEs with, with the purpose of creating a simplified standard for companies that are not listed on a public market, mm -hmm. uh, usually smaller companies. But now and again, people ask us, wouldn't it be a good idea? To, uh, there are also a lot of smaller companies that are listed that you would make IFRS for SMEs available also for mm -hmm. such companies even though they, they, they are listed, but they are small. We have decided to, again, not change the scope in that way. We are worried that if we would allow the name IFRS for SMEs to be used by listed companies, that we would consciously or subconsciously be looking, start looking differently at, uh, at the standard, um, that we might make it a little bit more complicated than otherwise would be the case. So we decided to leave it as it is. Perfect. You know, I hate to speak about Christmas in October, but uh, speaking of Christmas presents from the ISB, the IFRS for SMEs request for information is not the only one coming up. As our listeners may remember, we also intend to publish an exposure draft on the Primary Financial Statements Project. Hans, would you like to give us an update on this project? Well, already in July we took the main uh, decision, which was that the, the next step would be to publish a consultation document, which would be an exposure draft with a common period of uh, 180 days. Staff brought back the project uh, for a couple of smaller uh, topics, 
And the main question being, when we issue the exposure draft, should it be as a an amendment to the existing IAS-1, or should it rather be a new standard with a new name? And we decided that we would go for the latter, that the exposure draft would present our proposals as a new IFRS standard. Mm -hmm. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this month's board meeting was particularly full on. Other topics that were discussed included the disclosure initiative and the rate regulated activities project, classification of liabilities as current and non-current, extractive activities, management commentary and subsidiaries that are SMEs. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that in general, the issues mainly dealt with either sweep issues or inconclusive discussions. Were there any decisions that our listeners should pay particular attention to? There were no real decisions made. Uh, we had a general discussion how we can develop guidance on applying the qualitative characteristics in the conceptual framework for preparing management commentary. And we looked on qualitative characteristics as faithful representation, and these qualities include completeness, neutrality, and freedom for error. And we basically decided we have to reformulate these basic principles in more day-to-day -day language, <laughs> uh, because they, are very, they can be very complicated um, uh, and are mainly directed at the mm -hmm. board rather than at uh, preparers. Uh, so that's something that we still have to look at, uh, how can we write these requirements in, in language that people can easily understand. Mm -hmm. Also, I think the other thing that's worth mentioning is that uh, we made some progress on uh, a narrow scope amendment project mm -hmm. uh, to do with onerous contracts. Um, so we're looking at uh, clarifying what costs people need to think about when they're determining whether or not a contract is onerous, in particular clarifying what the cost to fulfil a contract means. Mm -hmm. And during the October meeting, um, we will discuss the list of costs that do and do not uh, relate directly to a contract and other feedbacks on the exposure draft. But the important thing was that the board agreed that we would proceed to make this narrow scope mm -hmm. amendment on IAS 37. So we'll be doing that shortly. And while I've got the mic, can I, can I put in a little ad break? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, for those of you who like podcasts, we have started to publish another podcast uh, which deals with the work that's being done on consistent application, including the decisions being made by the Interpretations Committee. So that's also now available on our website. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, that brings us to the end of our September podcast. Uh, thank you, Hans. And thank you, Sue. And thank you to all of our listeners. Uh, if you'd like to share any feedback on our podcast, please email communications at ifres.org. And a full summary of the board's discussions and decisions can be found on our website. All the papers prepared for the meeting are also available online. And don't forget that the board's meeting can be followed live. Thank you all.